I want to console you for the ingratitude of the wicked, and I beg of you to take away my freedom to displease you. The reality that there are saints and sinners is very clear to a mind. And thus, remember when she was a young girl before she joined, she prayed for the murderer Pranzini, who murdered three women in cold blood. And she wanted to console them because everyone is precious in God's sight, no matter how evil. And thus, when she offers her prayers for their, for their conversion, she is actually doing what God ultimately wants of us. If through weakness I sometimes fall, because she is still a sinner and weak, may your divine glance cleanse my soul immediately, consuming all my imperfections like the fire that transforms everything into itself. The glance of Jesus never leaves us, but we are the ones who turn away from him. And may we, once our eyes meet, we will be able to recognize our failures and really put our gaze back to him again. I thank you, O oh my God, for all the graces you have granted me, especially the grace of making me pass through the crucible of suffering. For her, even as a child, she is definitely in a sense, afraid of suffering and pain. But yet she also knows because our Lord wills that the glory be achieved through the cross that she would need to go through it. A crucible reminds us of the purification of uh, precious metals like gold, that we have to burn it in order to remove the impurities. The longer you burn and the more intense the heat, the purer it becomes. And thus her suffering, even as it goes on and on, becomes also in a sense more and more intense because as she enters, besides her spiritual purification, she enters also in a sense at towards the end of her life, the dark night of the soul, that God purifies her intensely. It is with joy I shall contemplate you on the last day carrying the scepter of your cross. The scepter is a royal symbol, and the scepter means that we are all sons and daughters of the King. And thus, we are all called to join into heaven, carrying the cross as our trophy and also as our mark of discipleship. Since you, give, you deign to give me a share in this very precious cross, I hope in heaven to resemble you and to see shining in my glorified body the sacred stigmata of your passion. We know that she did not receive the stigmata like the other saints, like Padre Pio or St. Francis of Assisi. I think she is also writing in terms of her bearing the cross voluntarily, deliberately. And the stigmata, if you know, will only appear on the soul or on us, when we, after carrying the cross, are nailed completely upon it and dies. And thus it is not so much as to carry, we also need to carry it to the end, where God wants and calls it quits. And when we finally die upon the cross, then the resurrection will come. The glorified body is a reference to the glory of the resurrection the glorified body of our Lord appearing to his disciples and asking Thomas to put his hands into his pierced side and into his hands to, of the mark of the nails. After earth's exile, I hope to go and enjoy you in the fatherland, but I do not want to lay up merits for heaven. The fatherland is heaven because our father is in heaven, and the exile also reminds us of the Salve Regina, that we sing, after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. If we are in exile, we are meant to return, and if we are exiled, we, have, we are powerless to return on our own until the permission is made for us to go back. And thus the permission for the rest is given gratuitously for us to go back to heaven. And actually, we can do very little to win heaven without the help of God himself. 
also, merits doesn't mean that we only work for our own salvation. We need to work also to save others and go along. She wrote famously also in the story of her soul, she said, draw me and we will run after the fragrance of your perfume. And thus with me, having the fragrance of Christ, this fragrance would draw other souls to follow in my stead and we will all go home to heaven together. I want to work for your love alone with the one purpose of pleasing you, consoling your sacred heart and saving souls who will love you eternally. Each of us, each, every soul is immortal. And thus we have an immortal destiny. And thus we have all an immortal capacity to love. The most sacred heart of Jesus is a very popular devotion at that time. Circling the sacred heart are thorns that represents pain that wants to be consoled. And thus in itself, this is all these images actually just brings to mind that the work is great and the laborers are few. And even every single one of us who can just do even a small part would already be contributing a great deal to God's plan and will. In the evening of this life, I shall appear before you with empty hands, I do, for I do not ask you, Lord, to count my works. Again, this is echoing St. John of the Cross in the evening of this life. He says, in the, evening of, in the evening, you will be examined in love. Our hands are always empty because, like what Job reminds us, um, Naked we come from our mother's womb, and naked do I return. Although the Lord did say we should store treasures in heaven, but those treasures, if done in love, will never be just for ourselves, but for also others. All justice is stained in your eyes, all our justice, because we can never see as perfectly as how God sees it. And thus she famously said she would give the benefit of the doubt to anyone who has hurt her. And this is a paraphrase, of course. I wish then to be clothed in your justice and to receive from your love the eternal possession of yourself. I want no other throne, no other crown but you, my beloved. The reward that truly will be worthy of her or truly will be recognized by God in heaven is that we have put on Christ, like what St. Paul has says. When we have put on Christ, then whatever that we do are all but cooperation with His grace. To be clothed with His justice is to know where we lack, because justice by definition, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, is to pay to the other his due. And thus, when we are just persons, we are also loving persons. We are persons living in charity. And with God possessing us, then we would learn to learn to live in this balance of justice and of love. Time is nothing in your eyes, and a single day is like a thousand years. You can then in one instant prepare me to appear before you. Like what she understands from the Psalms, which definitely she has known. To you, O Lord, a thousand days, a thousand years are by, like, by, are by like yesterday come and gone, no more than the watch in the night. And again, this is also in reference to the Christmas grace that she received in the year 1888, when God in an instant was able to release her from her sensitivity and bring her from, her, from that crybaby state into the mature person that she has become. So God can do miracles, she believes so. And if God wants it, he will allow it. But also, if he wants us to struggle, we would just be there to follow. Now we come to the heart of the offering in order to live in one single act of perfect love. Yeah? 
I offer myself as a victim of Holocaust to your merciful love, asking you to consume me incessantly, allowing the waves of infinite tenderness shut up within you to overflow into my soul, and that thus I may become a martyr of your love, O oh my God. A single act means everything that she decides from this point onwards is but a single offering. It's not individual acts. It's as if everything is now herself willing and doing. Again, this merciful love has the image of a fire. The living flame of love, like the Holy Spirit in himself, is gentle and consumes like the tongues of fire appearing above the apostles and our blessed lady the fire can be gentle in its burnings can also be vehement in its need to purify but again because of the nature of the soul being weak and also um, fragile the Lord knows how to deal with it in itself and the gentleness and the tenderness is as if Saint Therese asking the Lord, deal with me like a child, be gentle with me, give me bite pieces, send me little bit by little bit. You know how weak I am. And thus in itself as you burn me, as you let it come, and you will make me ready for the next wave, you will know that in this wave of love, I will then be able to love another because we cannot give what we do not have. And as we are consumed, we are also burnt up. And we are, in a sense, gradually sacrificed until whatever is left of us is completely surrendered unto God. For her, this is the meaning of being a martyr. A martyr in the sense of surrendering entirely, not just in one instance of laying our head on the chopping board and letting it be cut in one instant, but a continual offering daily, every moment, every single time that God calls us to be and to offer ourselves as victims for his love. A victim entails someone who suffers because to love is to suffer. May this martyrdom, after having prepared me to appear before you, finally cause me to die, and may my soul take its flight without any delay into the eternal embrace of your merciful love. This martyrdom would be a martyrdom without end, a martyrdom that only has respite if God allows it some light to shine through. Remember this act of oblation was written two years before she died. She may have already a premonition of her impending death through tuberculosis. And she also knows that it is not going to be an easy thing. She knows that death would in itself be painful because we would suffer. And thus in itself also, as a soul consumed by love would only die of love, like what St. John of the Cross writes in The Living Flame of Love, she prays that this will also be her end. If she is faithful to this offering, she would also hope that God will allow her to die in the end in love. And I think she did because her last words as she breathed her last, she says, my God, I love you. I want, O oh my beloved, at each beat of my heart to renew this offering to you an infinite number of times until the shadows having disappeared, I may be able to tell you of my love and eternal face to face. That is why she leave, she has left this writing or this offering next to her heart in her habit all her days, so as to remind herself of this offering and also to tell in its sense that this is a perpetual offering, a perpetual as if 
he vowed to God that I will never take back this offering no matter how difficult it is. Since it is your inspiration that you want me to do it, I obey and I offer myself to you. The eternal face to face is the famous beatific vision. Remember when Moses asked to see the face of God, God says to him, no one who sees my face can live. And thus we can only be perfect and face God face to face when we die in his love and we see him whom we love so much on a face to face forever. Where the shadows of this life, where the dark night of separation and purification has ended, whatever remains is only the merciful love of God welcoming us into our fatherland. So she famously then signed off um, this particular offering with the following um, words. Um, her name, actually her full name is Marie Francois de Ches. Ma Tang is the surname of the child Jesus and the holy face, her names and religion. And she, and according to the tradition of that time, she signed unworthy Carmelite religious. And this is given on the ninth day of June on the feast of the most holy trinity in the year 18. 95. Thank you, and I hope that this um, commentary is helpful for you and also uh, meaningful for your life. Thank you, and God bless you all. <laughs>